Nomadism by Michael McDonough Nomadism is more than travelling from A to B. It is everything about travellers. I live in a house and have done so for a long time, but that doesn't make me a settled person. Many country people who call themselves settled may in fact travel more than some travellers, but this does not make them nomadic. Nomadism is your whole outlook on life. It's how you view life, and it means that you see things in a different light, i.e. work, accommodation, and education, etc. The physical fact of moving is just one aspect of a nomadic mindset that shows in every aspect of our lives. Nomadism entails a way of looking at the world, a different way of seeing things, a different attitude to accommodation, to work, and to life in general. Nomadism affects all aspects of traveller life, even death. The standard way of coming to terms with bereavement is to move away from memories of the dead person. Just as settled people remain settled even when they travel, travellers remain travellers even when they are not travelling. Travellers who are not moving can and do retain the mindset of a nomad. This is why I feel it is important to speak of nomadism rather than travelling with regard to travellers. Hello and welcome to episode 36 of Blurini Belidish, the podcast from the National Folklore Collection, University College Dublin. That was an excerpt from the late Michael McDonough's article Nomadism in the book Travellers, Citizens of Ireland. Irish travellers, known in their own language as Minkers or Pavis, and an Irish called Unlucht Shul or the Walking People, are a nomadic ethnic minority in Ireland with a distinct history, culture and identity. Historically, travellers were called tinkers, a reference to their trade as tinsmiths, and they also made a living through engaging with the settled community around them by buying and selling animals or through seasonal farm labour. Travellers have also long been renowned as singers, musicians and storytellers who brought news, tales and songs and music from townland to townland, parish to parish and county to county as they travelled around Ireland. As a minority group, however, Ireland's travellers have long faced discrimination on the basis of their ethnicity and are often reported as the subject of explicit prejudice in Irish society, not having equal access to education, being denied service in pubs, shops and hotels and being subject to derogatory language. For this episode of the podcast, I hope to enter into an exploration of traveller culture and identity and I'm honoured to be joined by David Joyce, an advocate for the traveller community who has worked as both a barrister and a solicitor, and Anya Fury, a singer, musician, tour guide and alumna of the Department of Irish Folklore here at UCD. Running alongside our conversation, you will hear throughout this episode archival audio from our collections, a tape recording of Irish Folklore Commission archivist Sean O'Sullivan in conversation with Tom Bunn Connors and his mother Bridget, recorded in Cherry Orchard, Dublin in 1967 as well as part-time collector for the Irish Folklore Commission, Porrick McDrenna, on how he first met renowned traveller and storyteller Oni Power in County Longford in the 1930s. You'll also hear traveller songs recorded by the renowned song collector Tom Munley for the Department of Irish Folklore, and piping from the great Johnny Doran, recorded by Kevin Danaher for the Irish Folklore Commission in 1947. You'll also hear a recording made by the renowned photographer Alan McWheeney, specifically the singing of a young Andy Cassidy, with a wonderful rendition of My Rifle, My Pony and Me, recorded in Labra Park, Ballyfermot, Dublin in 1967. My thanks to Alan and to Pavi Point for permission to use this recording in the podcast. For time codes and specific information regarding recordings used in this edition of the podcast, please see the text description that accompanies this episode. So, I hope you'll keep us company for the next hour or so as we come to know and honour the culture, traditions, perspectives and experiences of Ireland's travelling people to whom this episode is dedicated. And now to my guests David and Anya, who introduced themselves briefly before moving on to share with me the ways in which their traveller heritage and identity has shaped and informed their lives. Yeah, as in, in David Joyce, and, and uh, I suppose I, I come from a traveller background. I've, um, I suppose, identify as a tra- as a member of the traveller community in Ireland, um, and over the years have been involved in in, in I suppose various um, I suppose issues and concerns of of, of the community, um, particularly in respect of, of of housing and accommodation provision. Over the years, it was one of my 
I suppose uh, areas of work in, in a previous life. Um, You're a lawyer, a barrister, uh, or solicitor. yeah, well, solicitor actually. Now I, I qualified a number of years ago as a barrister and worked as a barrister for for eight nine years, I think, um, mm. a bit longer, and then um, a few years ago I, I converted across and became a became a solicitor. So. Um, I've done both both aspects of the, both the legal profession uh, mm-hmm. in in Ireland. So um, and I've enjoyed both. You know, there, mm. there's 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 merits in in, in both professions, and, and um, it's something I've enjoyed doing over the last number of, of years, uh, probably the last fifteen years particularly. But prior to that, I I had been working in the area of um, I suppose campaigning work um, on on issues of traveller travel or concern um, as I said in housing and, and accommodation but mm. I previously worked as a youth worker and community worker in in, in County Offaly and in County Mead uh, with, with the traveller community and with members of my own community um, and you know I, I enjoyed that work but, mm. but I suppose over the, over that period of time saw changes happening within the community as well particularly a younger generation uh, and, and challenges that were I suppose arising for, for that community in terms of Identity and, and, and issues of, 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 I suppose, place and where they were, Longings. longing and, and where they were in society over, over the years, you know. Mm. So uh, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm ancient, but that's <laughs> a little bit of experience in, 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 in the community and with the community, you know. Mm. And then, Anya, just by way of introduction, like you're a singer and a musician and a tour guide. Um, and your family are a household name, like a legendary name in this country, as far as music yeah, furious, is furious, yeah, from our furious, my dad, and uh, actually, to, and anyone who, who who's listening, maybe who, mm. who isn't from Ireland or whatever, uh, who hasn't heard the furious, do yourself a favor and stop listening and go over to YouTube and. <laughs> and type in uh, the Furies and then come back in a couple of hours <laughs> sorry to interrupt but no that's fine especially the Lonesome Boatman for Dad because he he wrote that when he was about 17 and it's it's a lovely tune that mm. on the low whistle which he also invented with mm. Bernard Overton mm. but uh, yeah the, the Overton flute is, no was way. actually Dad's idea no way, Dad yeah. said to Bernard Overton Overton was um was struggling at the time. He used to work in a metal factory, and mm. uh, he was kind of struggling. Dad said, "You take the idea on, so uh, no way, right. you put it in your name." But it sh- and Bernard Overton had co- told him to call it the Finbar Fury f- flute. And Mum's always raging to this day that it wasn't called the Finbar Fury <laughs> flute. But anyway, but yeah, no. So Dad is from a traveller background, and um, David and I have discussed this before. I, you know, I was never in a, you know, raised in a traveller setting as such, but uh, very proud of my heritage and grown up to be very proud of my heritage. And my grandparents were travellers. My grand, all very musical. My granddad Ted played the fiddle. If you look up Ted Fury online, he's all over the YouTube. And well, we're uh, honoured here to have the Fury family songbook in, oh, was, was yeah. gifted to the archive as well. So it's yeah. a treasure that we have here. It's, as well. yeah. it's beautiful. Granddad made box fiddles and barons and things mm. like that. And, my grandmother played the banjo and they met at Pup Fair when Grandma was 14 and Grandad was 17. They got married. And yeah, long story, long tradition, many relatives all around the country, Cashes, McDonough's, mm. uh, wonderful relatives and uh, always going to the Fury gigs and stuff, mm. especially in Cork and Kerry. Mm. Lots of relatives down that direction. What are the most families you know now, the traveling people? Uh, well, there's, there's uh, an awful lot of them. So there's yes. uh, Connors. Uh, Connors is a big, um, a big, big race of uh, it, yes. big race of, yes. of, of family. Around uh, Dublin here. Oh, uh, Wexford, Wexford and Dublin. Wexford and Dublin, yeah. Of course, you can get him in England too. Oh, I suppose, yes. But in yes, England too. Oh, yes. Well, then there's the McDonicks, yeah. which is an awful big tail family. Oh. Where was they in the west? They down the Connick counties. Like, well, they, well, no, mostly around me, west, me, Longford, and down yes. along there, you see. I know, yes. And. Um, Tipperary, you can meet him anywhere, just I like know. ourselves, like. Yes, I know. Well, there's the McDonicks, as I said. Well, then there's the Callies, that are an awful race of them. Callies. Callies. Where are they? They be Tipperary. 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 Callies. Yeah. Yes. And there's the McDonicks. Yes, yes. Um, McDonicks, they're a big race. There's the Wards, who's a big Wars, race. Wards, of course, yes, in the West. And yeah. then there's the Jices. Jices, yes. They're Did a big race. Did you ever meet any of the Sheridans? They yes, indeed. They were from Rack Hill in the county yes, Limerick. Yes, and they were down in my own town of Ten Mayor and Kerry. I know King Mayor well yes. myself, sir. Yes. Indeed, I do well. Yes, yes. Indeed, I, I do. I know I every inch of Kerry. I know his castle. And yeah, so that's kind of my background. I'm always interested in learning anything to do with my heritage because mm. I've never lived it, but I've, I've. Yeah, I'm very passionate about it. So this is the question that kind of, it's one of the things that struck me in the piece I just read and Michael McDonough in his essay. 
where and it's something you kind of touch on there where he says just as settled people remain settled when they even when they travel travelers remain travelers when they are not traveling and so the question that comes to my mind is is what is a traveler or when is a traveler a traveler well you answered that for me i i i I was trying to apply for a job which was related with the national museum and the traveler culture collection and i i met David by asking him the same question because I was I well I had said to David oh I'm not really a traveller I'm not suitable for the job and he says well exactly that what is a traveller you know why are you not you know you're as much a right to that job as anybody else does so I I think you have a great answer for that you did for me anyway (laughs) well I'm not sure if I can remember what it was but (laughs) yeah and again I think you know as Michael there talks about a mindset and and I think it is a mindset in terms of, of of membership of a community yeah I think there's so many sort of stereotypes of the traveller and and there's so many kind of narrowed sort of narrowed stereotypes of what makes a traveller and I remember working with as the young people in the past and you know they weren't sort of going around shaking their shoulders sort of with a leather jacket and whatever uh, and and talking in a certain way or speaking in a certain way and they weren't they weren't considered travellers you know And, and maybe some of the kids who stayed on in school um, and 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 you know we're we're, we're doing education where it's kind of seen as oh if they're buffers they're not really travellers like mm. and it was I, I think the kids themselves had this very narrow impression of what a traveller was but for me it's it's much broader and I said it is a mindset in the sense like you know if you come from a, a kind of a line uh, of people who have identified uh, and have lived the life and and it's interesting that that Anya says like she identifies as coming from a tradition but her, she herself hasn't lived as a traveller and I think that's 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 important as well because there's a lot I think there's a lot of people in that position there's a lot of I suppose when you look at the the history of of, of sort of settlement of the traveller community and, and over the last sort of 50 years there's a lot of families who I suppose are now second generation you could say or third generation maybe um who have settled and haven't experienced maybe the life on, on the road, I, I, you know, that was seen traditionally as, as something the travellers did. Um, and, and where are they? What, you know, what, how did they identify? And, and is it for me to say, oh, because they never lived in a caravan, never travelled, that they can identify as, as, as a member of the community or as a member of the travel yeah. community? So I think it does come back to a mindset of, of as mentioned by Michael and his essay, um, that it is about... Perhaps a way of thinking about your own background, your own tradition, but um, you know you can you can consciously acknowledge it and you can consciously embrace it, um, or sometimes it's handed back to you. Even if I know families who would say that they don't want to be identified, but then they're identified by a broader society. They're identified by mm. by settling neighbours, perhaps sometimes, and and sometimes in a very cruel way. You know, mm-hmm. you know they can be called names or they can be, and and so. As I said, I use the term, it's handed back to them in a very negative way. Um, that mm. they came from a background, you know, they're always going to be described as the tinkers or whatever, mm. maybe in the, in the locality. And that's a very negative way of, 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 of having to, you know, as I said, having a thrown at you. But for me, you know, identifying as a traveller is something that you can do through, through having, I suppose, some connection to the history. So mm. some... And I, <laughs> You know, it's not like I said, and and there is different things. When you're talking specifically about Irish travellers and, and the Irish travel community and, and what in the past were described as thinkers or, or, or people who travelled uh, and engaged in in, in tense mating and, and other activities, um, that community, I think, has handed down certain traditions and beliefs and systems and even I think as Sonia said you know that's come through her dad or come through her family mm. there is elements of it that are still probably within her own mindset that's, and, and I think I have other travellers minds as well that, that you may not be conscious of but it's come, from, yeah, it's come from somewhere you know yeah. I mean it's yeah. like anything I mean, sometimes identity and, and, and culture is very can be very tangible but can also be very intangible you know and, yeah. and things come and it, you know you, you think in a certain way perhaps and you kind of think that has been handed to me from somewhere you know and, the sun is sinking in the west The cattle go down to the street The red ring settles in the nest It's time for a cowboy to dream Purple eyes in the canyon that's where i long to be would my three 
good companions, just my rifle pony and me. Gonna hang my sombrero and the land of a tree. Coming home, sweetheart, darling. For my rifle, pony, and me, with a will in the willow, sings a sweet melody, riding through o'er the willow, just my rifle, pony. No more towns to be open. No more streams will I see around the bend. She'll be waiting for my rifle, pony, and me. So, uh, to me, I think Michael's description is is perfect in terms of talking about a mindset. I mean, it is about. You know, I've lived in a house since I was twelve. You know, mm. uh, I've I've travelled more times in, in a camper van than I have probably in a caravan at this stage. But I still view travelling as important, or the notion of being able to move. But also the connections I have within within the community in terms of, of family connections, and it's interesting that that, that Anya mentions those as well. You know, there, there's yeah. those you know those distant relations perhaps that 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 i still feel connected to and mm. and would say um because i'm connected to them mm. uh, i feel part of the community as well so mm-hmm. there is a family structure that makes me part of it makes yeah. a traveler identity now family is important to a lot of virus i mean being rural Ireland as well extended like families in the past certainly were important um, um social structures but i think travelers have held on to it probably for a longer period of time than Mm. Among the settled community, oh, even in rural areas, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the answer to the question, I don't think there's a specific answer. I mean, there doesn't because I can, I can, I can, you know, I can give lots of stereotypes and I can give lots of generalizations upon travel is. But mm. for me, you know, the guy in the leather jacket with the shaky shoulders mm. isn't just the only type of traveller. Mm-hmm. The guy who's out sort of collecting scrap or whatever mm-hmm. is not the only type of traveller. I, I think you know, travellers over the last number of years have changed so much that there's a lot that can identify. But. Mm. I saw a lovely thing on on uh, TikTok. I think it was. There's this young girl. She's very good. She um, she does a podcast. I can't forget, I follow her anyway. But uh, she was saying that when she was a child, um, she didn't know. She wasn't aware she was a traveller, mm. and um, she was only about seven. And somebody in school said to her, oh, "You're only a traveller," you know. And it was very derogatory. But she went home and goes, "Am I a traveller?" You know, mm. and her, her brother just said to her, ah, you're stupid, you know, <laughs> but it was, it was a funny story, but you know. Yeah, well, it's interesting from what you, what you, what's been described there, because on the one hand, I'm kind of getting a traffic jam of thoughts here, but on the one hand, mm, me too. Um, there's a sense that you're describing your identity being handed back to you in what can be quite a negative way. Mm. So there's an explicit kind of uh, recognition of here is a distinct sort of identity and it's not good. Here, have this. This has been kind of given back to you in a derogatory yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. But then in another way, is there the absence of that as well, a kind of a lack of a recognition of a kind of specific cultural identity or do, do both have, do, do both things happen in a way, do you know what I mean? Where on the one hand, in a, in a um, maybe in a negative sense, there can be a derogatory reference to, oh, here's, here is traveller culture and identity, here it mm. is as, as a distinct thing. Mm. And yet in other parts in, of life, that's diminished and it's it's played down as though it's not separate travellers aren't different travellers don't have their own yeah I think there's a notion of appropriation of the positives you know and, and it happens in societies all the time you know you know, we as Irish sometimes get a bit pissed a bit no you can curse pissed, pissed off <laughs> uh, you know when, when, when English people or the British sort of claim some of our heroes whether it's in sport Sports or whatever, or whatever, yeah. whatever you know and I, I think the same happens in, in minorities within communities I mean obviously Irish travellers are very distinct Irish community. I mean, they're yeah. part of, of, of Irish society, and, and I have always, you know, I've always maintained that that's what we are. We're, we're, you know, we're Irish, you know, a group within our broader Irish society. So, you know, there's a multiple of identities going on there. We can identify, I mean, 
clearly identify as a proud Irish person whenever you know um, Ireland do well at something, whatever. But there is appropriation even within that type of society, and I think there is. I mean, the positives. I mean, I would use some of the, the traditions that travellers have maintained, and particularly in terms of music. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been an appropriation of, of that. Um, probably over the years and you look at some of the great Irish musicians um, and they deliberately use the term Irish musicians because that's what they are but also have come from a minority background come from a traveller background so whether it's the Fury family or whether it's the, the Keenans or the Doran, Doran families yeah. you know those are people who have maintained a very strong Irish traditional music tradition and, and you know sometimes it gets appropriated by broader society because that's, that's what they've done they've done something very positive in doing that um, and somehow that they're made to seem um, well they're not really travellers because they you know they took on a very strong Irish tradition but like they didn't I mean it, it was part of what they are it was part of, of their tradition and, and part of their you know they are Irish in the same way as everybody else so that's what they've maintained and that's what they've been positive about but it gets appropriate some way so and I think that happens when, when travellers when there are positives um, it gets appropriate and taken away whereas you're left with all the negatives so that's where you get I think with the travel community particularly all of the negative stereotypes are left with the community and the positives are, pro- are, are sh- appropriate are shared are shared or appropriate and sometimes deliberately stolen you know I mean it's not just what Irish I mean you see something even across cause, I mean you know in, in Central Europe for example around Romani traditions and mm. Romani music I mean what is seen sometimes as, as, as traditional Hungarian music is effectively Roman music that was has been appropriate, and the same in Spain. You know, you know the the, the, the tradition of, of of Spain, the the singing flamenco. tradition, the flamenco. Mm. Flamenco is a, is a, is a, is a Romani tradition that has been appropriated by the Spanish um, as something that has now been sold to tourists. You know, mm. so there's an element of that it happens. So the, the, the positives get taken, and and sometimes the, the the minority community is left with the negatives. So do you think those those positives get absorbed or get get? stripped away of, of their own specific kind of background or something like well, it's just an element of stripping away the background I mean for me the positive about would be that they're shared I mean some of the Irish you know, the Irish music that travellers have perpetuated and, and, and continue to maintain have come from within an Irish music tradition um, so the, you know the, it, 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 it's something that needs to be shared as opposed to mm. Mm-hmm. I have found I don't know if it's related games, but know? growing up mm. with dad being dad and everybody embracing dad and he, well he wasn't famous as he was you know he was a well known musician when I was in the 70s mm-hmm. but he only you know Greenfields of France and everything was much later in the 80s but you know growing up very proud of dad very proud you know going to gigs and it was all wonderful and uh, knowing my background I would always say I, I was brought up the, the heritage I heard was always very romantic I suppose which I mentioned to you before Johnny mm. um, but then as you got older and you start hearing people talking derogatory bad about travellers and you're starting to take that on board and go hang on a minute what's this you know and you know when I was growing up it was all very beautiful and the whole thing was very beautiful but as you got older it started not that it wasn't beautiful but you started to see oh there's people that don't like where I come from and then you start getting quieter about who you talk to about where you come from and judging the room and I do anyway and I still do mm. and even two two years ago at a job interview I won't even mention the place but you know and people in the room talking about travellers and I just kind of went okay not going to work here you know and mm. things like that because you just even like I'm 50 now and I'm still judging a room because yeah. where am I allowed to talk about where I'm from mm. you know and it's mm. it's horrible it gets me angry now you know mm. it really gets me angry because I'm so proud of where I've come from and it's mm. like you said it's like John or David say you know you people take the good and mm. leave you with the bad and mm. you're kind of <laughs> but it's a very complex layer and web to navigate in the sense of um I think it's something David that you either said or read of yours before this idea of hiding in plain sight mm. you know that travellers hide in plain sight sometimes mm. that I think that's the one that I think a lot of younger travellers uh, mm. are now sort of navigating. I mean, for me, as I said, I, I came from a sort of a, an activist background, so I wasn't one of the hiding brains that I couldn't do it as such. <laughs> but, mm. but the point is that, that yeah, I, I do see it with younger travellers. And I, I mean, I, I'll be perfectly honest, I see it with some of my own kids at times. You know, that's, that's what they do. They're, um, certainly, they're in professions and... and, and, and um, they can easily hide in plain sight, and uh, you know because of 
But why should you have to? That's what well, and that's yeah. the thing. Why do you have to? And and what is the effect of that? I mean, it's like this. You know, it's this. Um, we are, and it's not that you want to be a defender. It's not that you want to be an activist. You just want to get on with what you do. You're just mm. going on with your. You know, if you have chosen a profession or if you've chosen a career and you're in that career and you're happy in it. You don't actually want to be a, an activist on behalf of travellers, but you don't actually have to put up with the abuse as well of colleagues constantly belittling the community in which you you may not openly identify with, but you, you know you you acknowledge where, where where you come from. You acknowledge that it's part of your your background, um, and constantly having to hide that connection, I, I think it has a certain kind of psychological it must do, yeah. impact on, on on younger people and you know it's not fair it's not fair to do that so I mean I think I spoke before about just the notion of being conscious like you say you talk about judging a room uh, and you have to judge the room it, I always put the onus back on the people in the room that they they need to judge the room because they need to be aware of where they are because you know the young person they're speaking to may well be from a travel background or you know and uh, and you know, using derogatory terminology and language all of the time, thinking that it's acceptable and open, it just shows how ignorant they can be themselves. That they, that they don't acknowledge that their colleagues may well come from a community in which they are now being derogatory about, um, which means they're not acknowledging the potential or the latent ability within that community to progress into into professions. And this is what I went back there earlier on about the stereotypes or generalizations of who the community are that oh they'd never get involved in the professions or they'd never get involved in education that they're, you know, if they're not out collecting scrap and living in a caravan they, 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 they couldn't be in here in this office with me or mm-hmm. you know, working or whatever so it, it's, it's not for me as a traveller to have to always judge your room or for Anya you know, from her background having to always judge your room I, I think there's an onus on, on, the, on the broader settled community to begin to realise that and to be more sensitive to the rooms that they're in, that you know. In. But yeah, I mean, the idea of having to hide in plain sight, I think, does cause problems in the future. I think it causes problems, you know, just constantly having to, you know, having to put up with sort of the, the little everyday sort of jibs and jibes, if that's the proper word, and mm. um, just just to get on in life. And 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 I don't think people have to be activists all the time. They don't have to be out there campaigning. And they shouldn't be forced, that shouldn't be forced on them, you know. They mm. should be allowed to get on with their life without mm. having to put up with, with negative comments and, 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 and materials. So I can see why, why young travellers do hide in plain sight, but I can also see the difficulties of doing that as well, you mm. know. What I like the Kerry people for, sir, I wouldn't leave Kerry, and in my young days I'd done two years in it. When I go to a door and I had a big family, yeah. And I did depending upon the people yeah. for to help me in some way. Well, the first thing they do now, they be all at their dinner. I'll never forget him. And I'm an old woman, I suppose, I'll never be in again. And it's not so that you are a bit of to carry, but I'll only give them their merit. The table will be here, and all the men will be here at the table, eating the dinner. And the very minute that you'll go the door, to the door and knock, the woman will, come on, come on and you're welcome. Come on and you're welcome. Well, where would that be done in Ireland? Mm. It was never done in all county with me, so yeah, but I travel up a good many counties. Well, the and I, know. Ago, I suppose two were better maybe than the people now. They were well, more generous. Well, there are parts of the country. Have you entered the door and the men at the table that hiss the dogs at you? Yes. Are you sure even in Dublin? You know, sure I do hear it. Do you know the time it is one o'clock? You what sit, brought you around? Sit mummy for a minute anyway. You Do you know what I mean? Right. You're not wanting at one o'clock. Mm. At mm. all, in no place. Well, you'll be brought in, Dave. Well, upon me word of me, I, I often think of it. I do think of the country that I did never wish for to leave it. And the first thing then, when will you be back again? It seems in many ways like there's, at the core sometimes, and not just travel but it reminds you of something of... of um, people I was interviewing years ago in the south inner city um, from a kind of a working class area that had suffered its fair share of, of trouble through the 60s, 70s and 80s that at the core of a lot of the reminiscences when I spoke to older people there was a huge sense of pride but there was also really closely wrapped around it a kind of sense of shame as well mm. in, in it and is that something do you think that, that it's, it sounds like in a similar way that it's something that maybe for me it's a huge sense of pride and then when people start giving out to you you kind of think am I supposed to be ashamed <laughs> yeah. I'm not ashamed yeah. but it's like those people think I should be ashamed 
yeah. rather than being ashamed. Mm. Now, some people, I'm sure, you know, you probably mm. say do feel ashamed and mm. shouldn't. Personally, I don't think. But it's like you know, um, you know, to me, it reminds me of the tenements and when everyone was moved out of the tenements and that shame of living in the worst slums in Dublin and yeah. you know, not saying where you're coming from. It's the same kind of idea, really. Mm. If you're bringing it back to. Uh, settled people as such but mm. um, yeah no I, mean, I don't want to feel ashamed but people want me to feel ashamed mm. if that's what I feel yeah no so I, and I agree I agree with, with on your sort of analysis there on that I mean I think that is a reality that that, that that shame does come into it you know and there is a an element of, of I suppose um, pride perhaps in, 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 in a background but when it's constantly been denigrated and, and, and put down and uh, there's constantly negatives um, spouted, yeah. whether it's you know in a room with, with other individuals or you know in the media constantly. Um, it, it it forces shame on people. I mm-hmm. think you know, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it creates a negativity that just mm-hmm. it's hard to carry sometimes mm-hmm. for for people. You know. And do you think then that younger travellers feel like travellers today? Yeah, I think there's just certainly the many of the ones I would meet would still very strongly traditionally um, I would, 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 would identify uh, as fast travellers and I think others I see are are probably less likely to identify will certainly talk to you about their their background in, in a sort of a way where, when they feel safe about it but mm. aren't necessarily vocal about it and, and don't necessarily want to be vocal about it and I can see, you know, I can understand that, you know. And then there's, there's a, what I see, a younger group of campaigners, perhaps, who are there and, and are very vocal. And, and that's a good thing, you know, because it, it, it's sort of saying, but I suppose their experience um, from a different generation is slightly different than my experience or, or to mm. Anya's experience. Um, but they're, they're out there and they're, and, they're, and they're strong and they're proud and they're, they're, they're maintaining a, um, a, and, and they're maintaining a sense of justice or, in, you know, was injustice, but certainly maintaining that a campaign for justice, perhaps, which is what they feel is, is necessary, and mm. I would agree with a lot of what they say as well. You know, in mm. terms of um, having to do that, you know, because there's still a lot of inequalities and, and inequities in, in in society, and and travellers experience those um, much more. Than, than many other groups in, in our society. So, I think more than any other group. Yeah, well, yeah perhaps yeah. more than any other group. I do and, and I think the think fact that. that there's some people now trying to address those inequalities and, and being um, very vocal about it is a good thing, you know. Mm. Um, but equally, as I said, I think there's a lot of travellers who are younger, younger generation perhaps, who are hiding in plain sight and I feel that's a safer way to get through life. There's yeah. a sense, or is there, so again, I think it's something from a talk that you've given the idea that that quote unquote successful travellers had broken away from traveller culture. <clears throat> that is their sense of kind of um, as somebody moves into another sort of profession or whatever that they're leaving one culture behind or something or Yeah, and well, I think that's probably more of um uh, it goes back to what I was saying I think earlier just about appropriation I think sometimes that those travellers are, are appropriate in some sense now I don't know if they think they want to be appropriate or they want to move away but sometimes they are can be pushed the away by yeah mm-hmm. they can be a push and pull thing they can be certainly pushed away by as I said some travellers who see their identity as something that's very traditional and very set in, 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 a, in a period of time perhaps and you know if you do receive an education or you go on and you, and you, and you go to university or, or, or receive a third level education and some, somehow you've changed yourself so you're not mm. part of our community anymore and then that, that, and that's the push factor from, from as I said some families who are quite traditional perhaps and then there's the pull factor from, from the set community so well, look the, you know when you talk about travellers you can't really talk about David or you can't talk about Anya or you can't talk about others because mm. look they've done the right thing they've, they've settled and they've got an education and they're now contributing to, to society so you're being pulled away from the community as well as as, as being pushed away sometimes as well mm. and and for me you know as someone who has sort of done total level education has qualified in, into a trade or into a trade into a profession <laughs> I did qualify into a trade as I would be saying but um we won't go there um, <laughs> you know I, I, I try to resist the push and I also try to resist the pull you know I mean I am who I am and I yeah. identify as coming from a travel community but equally I would say to, to families or individuals who might say to me oh you're not a traveller anymore 
you know, I'm as much of a traveler as you are still, mm-hmm. just because you have whatever your truck there and you're out collecting scrap or whatever you're doing. You know, I do what I do and, mm-hmm. and that's who I am. And equally, I would, uh, well, as I, you know, work within the set community and, 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 and do that. Um, I try not be pulled into it in the sense, I when I say not be pulled into it, I try not to be appropriate to say, well, look, I'm a good traveler. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, whether I'm a good or bad, I am what I am. I, mm-hmm. I come from background. That's what I am. That's yeah. what you're working with. That's 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 where we are now. Mm. Um, but don't try and say because I've got an education or I got qualified that I'm better than a lot of mm-hmm. other families or other other individuals in the community. Um, f- for me, you know, we're all equal. Um, it depends on the opportunities you get as to what path you pursue. So yeah, when I, sp- when I spoke about that, that's what I was getting. I think just the push and the pull factor. And mm-hmm. I think you have to resist both. You know, you have to fight against that push, being pushed out of the, the community and being pulled into it's something real. else as well, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, I suppose as well, it, it, it shows the fact that, that I think a lot of people, a lot of settled people probably think that of Travers as a kind of one block, one homogenous unit, which mm-hmm. is not the case at all either. Yeah, and I think it comes from a, a very negative historical sort of analysis of the community here that, that, you know, we are seen as some sort of dropouts of mainstream society. So, you know, we've progressed on, that, you know, once we move away from that, that's a positive thing. So why do you talk about... So it almost sees the entire community as some sort of criminalised group or something, you know, that that's, you suddenly give up all of that identity because you have advanced and you're now educated or whatever and and I think that's an unfair analysis of who that community who the travel community are and where they've come from you know mm. they're not a club they're not a group they're not someone that you just you know I don't have a membership card of the travel <laughs> community uh, I am you know it's what I was born and that's why my family were traditionally and, and, and going back generations were tinkers who moved around the roads of Ireland providing a service mm. um, to, to farmers or whatever that, that, that they did it and, and you know we've come through and, and society has changed you know you know Irish people don't still live in, in traditional thatched cottages travellers mm. still don't live in, 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 in barrel top wagons or, or, or canvas covered tents um, so you know, we've progressed essentially with society, even though people say, you know, travellers are somehow backward in terms of, 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 of their thinking. They're not, you know. We've all moved forward. Um, and, you know, the idea then of, of moving forward is that moving forward doesn't mean you, you're moving out. So, I mean, because I've, as I said, received an education, doesn't mean I've now progressed that I don't have to hang out with the travellers anymore. <laughs> And, and that's an unfair responsibility to say and that's I think the attitude is that travel some sort of a closed club of negative of, 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 of almost a criminal sort of group that you move away from them I, there are certainly some travellers who are criminal um, but you know they get dealt with um, but the travel community itself is, is a group that has existed in our society for hundreds of years if not thousands perhaps I don't think I don't know the history is there but certainly it's it's a cultural group as opposed to any other group and I just identify with that aspect of the cultural background mm. you know so do I definitely it's yeah. the culture that I yeah. identify yeah. with uh, my grandmother yeah. was a fortune teller you know mm. and loads of jewellery black hair yeah. till the day she died and mm red mm. lipstick pink dresses and she was just wonderful she yeah. was everyone in Ballyfermot used to come up to her for fortunes you know mm. everyone yeah. knew my grandmother and she was a great woman mm. yeah. and uh, yeah no I uh, just identify with all that the culture like David said you know absolutely mm. Mm. 100% I mean in that sense like you mentioned the, the say historically travellers travelling the roads of Ireland in family groups and you were saying that pres- providing a service to to farmers and so on and so on. What what historically were some of those the skills and the the skills and the trades that, that travelling people brought around Ireland? Well obviously the working in tin and metal and obviously hence the name Tinker it mm. comes from that, that idea of, of, of tin smithing and, and, and I suppose brass smithing and, and, and working in, in, in metals um, which were you know light enough to be able to kind of carry with it you know on, on the back of a cart or on, the, on your back at times perhaps um, so obviously that tradition of and then what that brought into a community obviously you know the usefulness of that um, you know whether it was to farmers or to to, to farmers wives or, or, or small you know rural areas that that's you know where you didn't have hardware's selling plastic buckets um you know people that came you know repaired and and, and not just you know 
you know, making tin pans and, and, and pots and cans. I mean, I came across an old guy who was a traditional thinker who one day making a a worm and, um, for, for, a steel. for a steel for a particular type of, of instrument so I mean that kind of thing you know, so they did you know those are that certainly the, the kind of tinsmithing and, the, and the, the, the metal work but you ever meet a travelling man now who does tinsmith work as they did in the old days the plastic the, the enamel nearly finished that but uh, those plastic that completely finished them all oh, together. I suppose, yes. They were so cheap. They were so cheap. You can buy a bucket there for three bob now, or three and sixpence, yeah. where I'd have to charge three and sixpence or yes. four bob to bottom a bucket. Yes, I know. As a matter of fact, I'm a tinsmith myself. Are you? You learned the trade? Oh, I'm a tin make anything, almost really? anything, so I yes. Know. Or and mend you, anything. And you did practice at it? Oh, yes. Yes. All, and, um, we came from that. The, I know. the first of I came from that. The breed seed and generation of me down. Yes, I know. Was tinsmiths. Yes. My mother's father was one of the best tinsmiths in Ireland. Really? That's really. true. What was his name? Dan Dorden. Dorden. Dan Dorden. Where Dorden. was he from? Where was he mainly? Well, <coughs> New Ross, sir. New Ross. And then to had great shops in it. Uh, <coughs> was All he related at all? You know Felix Dorden? He was. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. He'd be one of that he family. Was. He was. Yes, sir. Yes. All the one people. Chip of the one block. Chip of the one block, yes. But I mean, other areas of, I mean, obviously they, they provided sort of seasonal uh, agricultural sort of labour to farmers as well before mechanisation. Um, you know, the, the idea of, of um, you know, certainly their, their, their animal husbandry and their ability around horses and that mm. lent something, and lent a skill and lent something that they were able to, uh, you know, dealing in horses and, and, yeah. and, and, and bringing kind of, even in case of bringing donkeys into areas because that would have been a, a traditional sort of activity as well where they did bring kind of um, so they, they were kind of the main areas uh, certainly going back a hundred years I um, mean obviously as time progressed the you know as as, as as traders they would have brought other aspects of of, of, of sort of needs that were required in, in, in rural areas and um, whether it was carpets or other sort of things or blankets that they traded in you know certainly were brought in as entertainers, I mean, the most obvious mm. thing, and you look at the families who were entertainers, I mean, they were travellers, I mean, they also had, I suppose, skills to supplement that, but, but they brought music and they brought entertainment into, into villages and into towns and into rural areas. <laughs> As I even love the sh- <laughs> I do a chance to knock Have you any pots or kittles Or rusty holes to block Or oh, indeed I have to be sure I have But me rightful to a laddie Or oh, indeed I have Oh the mistress she had opened the door And told me to come in You're welcome jolly tinker I hope you brought your tin Or oh, indeed I did So be sure I did But me rightful to a laddie Or oh, indeed I did Oh she brought me to the kitchen And she she brought me out the hall for pots and kills and pans. Sure, I surely done them all. Ah, oh, indeed I did. To be sure I did. Hurt me rightful to a laddie. Ah, oh, indeed I did. Oh, she brought me up the stairs to show me what to do. And she fell on the feather bed and I fell on the toe. Ah, oh, indeed I did. To be sure I did. Hurt me rightful to a laddie. Ah, oh, indeed I did. Oh, she puts her hand in her pocket and she offered twenty pound. Come on. Me jolly tinker sure will have another round Ah, oh, indeed I did, so be sure I did But me rightful to a laddie, ah, oh, indeed I did No, good man, good man. <laughs> And, you know, I think it's been well recorded in the past about the fact that, that many Irish tunes, like, moved around the country because travellers brought them with them yes. so, I was going to say, uh, yeah. tunes and so, stories Yeah, and so you had that news, news. Yeah. 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 So those news. sort of things were the aspects that were, were brought into rural communities, particularly mm-hmm. And it's easy to forget those things now in the day of the internet and, and, and mm. the television, you yeah. know, that those things were, were essential, you know, uh, when before, you know, pr- prior to any sort of mass communication. Yeah. That's how you communicate and that's yeah. how things moved around, that's how things travelled. Um, so they, they did contribute in those, in, those, in those areas and that was part of what they did. Um, and as, it, as time progressed and certainly over the last 40 or 50 years, you know, that those are the trades perhaps died off um, and and you know other other things replaced them perhaps mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and certainly recycling in cars and, and, and that for a while became um, a, a, an occupation for many families scrap collecting 
um, you know, which things are now encouraged in terms of a green economy and, and, mm-hmm. and that maybe the way in which it was done hasn't been resourced enough among the greenie, but certainly they had skills in, in, in recycling, mm-hmm. which now people are saying is, is you know, is required mm-hmm. and needed, you mm-hmm. know. So I, I think they've been on, the, in certainly in more recent times, on the verges of, of sort of economic activity that they didn't get pushed out of because now, you know, with recycling being licensed in certain ways, a lot of activities and, and, and the way travellers did it is now being pushed to the margins and further to the margins, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I think historically they have provided I think I think any community, any any nomadic community is opportunistic. So they will always find, even apart from their core activities, they will always find a way to turn a shilling. And that's what travellers did. And that's how they did it. You know, I mean you look at the Roman communities across Europe, they did something very similar. So, you know, they became opportunistic to make a living and, 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 you know, apart from their core activities, they would have other trades and occupations to, to you know, as I said, to supplement, I, I, that. supplement that. And whether it was flower making or mm. basket making, you know, they found mm. ways of, of a need in a local area. And if they didn't want tin buckets, they may well need um, baskets for, 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 for turf or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and they could turn their hand to that as well. Mm. So there's opportunistic... I suppose adaptation of, of their trades but the, the, the central I suppose core feature of it all was that they were self-employed that they could move with their families that it wasn't tied to a 9 to 5 position you know and if you were travelling with your family you needed to be able to move and you needed to have an occupation to be able to support your family as you moved mm. so mm. I think that's that's what, what the distinction was I think it's it's something that we forget nowadays as well with the strength of traditional music and song that it wasn't always so, like that it wasn't always didn't always have the popularity that it does today. Often when we think of traditional music and traditional singers, that it's in a state of good health in this country largely. Yeah, like, no, it was there was a big revival, wasn't there, in the early yeah, 1900s? But, but that before that, yeah. in many from in many ways, it was the travelling people who maintained those stories yeah. and songs. I mean, that's something that's been found through the, the collections in the archive here. Um, even really rare forms of English language balladry that were thought to have died out in England in the late medieval and they were found I'm thinking of John Riley in Boyle County Roscommon oh, okay. um, or another actually song I'll play now in a minute from John Riley it was a nephew of his also called John Riley who Tom Munling one of the collectors I was going to mention Tom yeah, yeah, yeah and did you ever meet Tom? yeah he was yeah. taught me in music I never yeah, met the, him, I never yeah he taught the music I, well, I did a higher diploma in Irish folklore here in the mm. folklore department and Tom Munley taught us Now the Lord and his lady They went walking one day Said the Lord to his lady Those words he did say Be aware of false Lancome Artisan of his men, be aware of false Nora, and don't let her in. And I'm not afraid of false Lancome, artisan of his men. Knife my door fairly bolted and my windows barred in. Though the Lord was not long gone, when false lying come came in, and he knocked at the door. And the nurse let him in. Say now where is the Largan? Art is is he adding? He is gone to fair England for to speak to the king. And the fall snow like Epson Jakey. Wow. Surely then in your own life and growing up, music must have been the core and kind of just oh. the lifeblood of the home. Like, what was that What was that like growing up? What's your memory of, of music? It just was. was it? it just was part of the house. Like dad, now dad spent a lot of time on the road playing music. So he'd be gone for six, eight weeks here and there. But when he came home, it was, you know, he'd 
after he'd rested a bit that the pipes were always out or play, writing a new song or the, the brothers would come down and they'd be rehearsing in the house there was always music there was always uh, musicians from Germany or wherever you know staying on the floor sleeping on the floor and whatever there was always music there and again like I said earlier you know when I was tiny and growing up that's just what life was, you know, and it always was life until mm. I was a you know, late teenager that I realized that this isn't how everybody's life is. This mm-hmm. is just how your life is. And, mm. you know, traveling, that was one of the things as well. Like you, it was always a, a treat to go off with dad on the road. Mm. And uh, he'd be telling us like that cross means this and that tree over there, you put coins in that and all these stories. And me and your brothers, your granddad used to wash under that waterfall there and we'd wash in that lake there. And all these things that you just took for granted uh, that you just knew the land backwards. And that mm. was, that's another thing about the travelers that I grew up with anyway, just knowing the land backwards, you know. Do you travel around the country? I traveled to 32 counties of Ireland, sir. But you don't do that every year? Back, no, do you? I give it up altogether, sir. You don't travel at all? No, back, do you? no, I travel back down as far as Arklow, Wicklow, or Gorley, or Innescorty, but that's all now. But you did travel? Well, I travelled the whole 32. Really? I did, we sir. We knew the coffees, sir, in Kerry. Yes, very much indeed. We knew the coffees. Well, I knew. Well, I know, so I know Kerry as well as I know. I know Kerry as well as I know the town I was raised in. So do I. I do every inch of Kerry. It's a very nice place. I come from King Mayor myself. King Mayor, I know it. Which is there for Sheridan's work. Well, I know King Mayor. 21 Mile Road. We camped there, sir, at a little church, Catholic Which Church. Wrong? The 21 Mile Road. Where is that? Has gone from Killarney. Has gone from Killarney to King Mayor. Over the hill, yes. Yeah. Mall's Gap. Mall's Gap. You call it the 21 Mile Road. We call it the <laughs> head. Nice yeah. <laughs> there were no houses. No houses. And the gap at all low. Excuse me, Mammy. Yeah. Well, do you ever remember that little river that was running there in King Mayor, sir? Do you ever remember that little river was running? The Fennehy River. Yeah. There, was a li- there was an old stone bridge <laughs> there. Right, not, yeah. Tell me, is that old stone bridge there oh, still? It's, it's still there, as far as I know, just at the edge of the town. Just at the edge of the town. Well, I, I crossed that bridge in my bare feet. Did you really? And I'd safely say that that's an antique bridge anyway. <laughs> no, no, what I think is very old. That'd be yeah. antique if, if you, you could ever get it out of it. Do you know? And the rural community as well, you know, there's all the, the stories of the land, but Dad definitely had it and he got it from somewhere, you know, he got it from his father, mm. tra- travelling with his father and everything all around Ireland and everything and uh, just that, yeah, just wealth of tradition as well as just music. It's not, yeah, mm-hmm. it's the music, but everything had a story. Mm. Everything came from somewhere, you know, from someone or somewhere. Mm. Now that came to me from, I learned that from Johnny Doran and I learned that from Leo Rousam and I learned that from, you know, everything has a story, mm. which is lovely. You know? Did your father know the Dorans? Or did yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny and Felix, I think. I think Felix more. Have to, I, I don't, yeah, mm-hmm. not 100% on that. Um, but. And just sorry for anyone again who's listening because you probably mightn't be aware, like the Dorans are renowned as some of the finest pipers um, in Ireland's history musically really and there was a recording made of them by the by the Folklore Commission by the place here in 1947 um, after uh, John Kelly on, and he was a, he was a legend in, in his own right a Clare musician who lived in Dublin he, he was in Cable Street and he was a friend of Johnny Doran's and he contacted the commission saying you you got you need to record this guy and the record The Bunch of Keys was made oh, okay. um, and so those recordings were here and then he died sadly Shortly, mm. shortly enough after that, nineteen fifty, yeah. yeah, he died. Um, yeah. Actually, if Eva Kelly, um, John Kelly's granddaughter, has made a lovely archive kind of site about him, and you can find information there about um, not just about her grandfather, but also the stuff about the doors there and the history and the, the context. Yeah, no, Dad knew. Dad didn't know Johnny, obviously. Um, granddad knew Johnny Dor, mm. and Dad definitely based his pipe and style on Johnny Dor. Really? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And Davy Spillane too, if mm-hmm. you know Davy Spillane. Yeah, of course, so, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But Actually, Dad, Dad would have taught Davy. I remember Davy coming to our house in Waterford in Dunmore East, learning the piping style. Davy's not a traveller, but his style is definitely a traveller style of mm-hmm. inland pipes, you know, mm-hmm. absolutely. And absolutely loves that, you know. He has mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that lovely traveller style is just... Uh, Thank you. 
but uh, yeah, that lovely traveller style is just. Uh, well, there was some. I mean, think of people, Margaret Barry. You know what I mean? These. Like, she wasn't a traveller. Margaret Barry wasn't no, a traveller. No, she wasn't. Why, why no. is she so associated with all? Yeah, she just she, took on the persona. She took on a persona. Yeah. Really? I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's never been. I mean, she was her family would have been Cork background, but yeah, she didn't like. In the sense, like we're talking about what is a traveller. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I don't want to disown her as such, but certainly she took on a persona of being the wandering. Yeah, yeah. Sort of singer, but like her 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 background wouldn't have been as a member of the traveller community I mean, in terms of but she she took on that sort of menstrual role and that mm. and the background mm-hmm. and I think and I think it was still added to her as well as mm. being a traveller that's know, fascinating her, I never knew that at all well there's a lady well there's a lady now that I do know well I know her for years I know her as a matter of fact since I was a child yeah like that Margaret Mary, I know uh, she used yeah, to be on the... I know Margaret as well as... Well, I know her uh, nearly as long as I know anybody. Like, I, I remember her now as long as I can nearly remember anybody kind of thing. Like, Well, I've met her, sir. I met her, I met her in her early days, in her good days, like, I met her. And then I met her in her... Yes. In the bad ones, too. Where is she now? Well, the last, the last place she... The last place I've seen Margaret was in... Um, in the... A place down Mayo, a place, place, what? Swinsford? Swinsford, yes, Swinsford. Swinsford, Swinsford. Yes. Swinsford was the last place. She lived in a little house there, but she's, she's not there now. She wouldn't have been, shall we say, born into a, a known traveller family. You know, mm. So is, is it, do you think it is a familial, it's a particularly familial thing? It's by blood, like, is it well, to do I with the family? Well, I think that's the of Mary Keenan, Paddy's uh, mother Mary. I mean, she was settled, she was... Uh, their, her family were farmers and mm-hmm. she married Johnny Keenan old Johnny Keenan mm. but absolutely lo- you know that was her life and the tattoos across her hand mm-hmm. and Johnny and, and my granddad and grandma had the tattoos as well Ted and Nora and they had Johnny and Mary you know And mm. but uh, Mary was I always thought Mary was a traveller and it was only after before shortly before she died dad was telling me or i remember dad her. telling me that she wasn't she was from you know she was you know not of the traveler blood as you would say mm. but to me she was a traveler you know mm. yeah i mean I, as I, said, I think there obviously is a, a notion of, of of sort of family kind of yeah, origin and stuff mm. and not like it's sort of, i suppose describing it as blood but certainly people have married into it and people have married out of it mm. You know, but you know, you're taking on or buying a caravan in the morning <laughs> and living in, on the side of the road doesn't make you a traveller. You know, in the sense that, it, it, and we, as I said, speaking specifically about Irish travellers, um, but so there is that kind of. I suppose for many families, a lot. You know, if you meet someone and you're saying, oh, you, you, know, you come from a traveller background, they're asking you who you are. You know, who your family are, who your background is, who your relations were. So that's a way of making that connection. You know. Mm. Um, but you know people have married into it and have become you know like mm-hmm. like Mary you mentioned Mary Keenan um, have become you know part of that community and, and that, that is you know I mean you know and likewise obviously people have married out of it you know there's, there's mm-hmm. well known stories of, of travellers who've married a second community and, and have, have left that behind what they say left behind but um, it is fam- familial in a sense that mm-hmm. there is that tradition of, of family background mm, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and tracing your origins perhaps through family like you know mm. yeah. yeah and when like traditionally what times of the year use traveling people travel I mean was it were there specific times the fairs I suppose mm. would it be yeah I think different people had different and I think different patterns I mean you look at as in, in, and now we're talking historically I suppose because mm. you're, you're looking at that sort of and different parts of, of the country had different circuits you know so certainly Midland I, my family would be associated with the Midlands um you know, they're they probably a smaller circuit, so you travel within one or two counties, you know, you know, whether it's Longford or Offaly or West Mead or, or parts of Mead. Um, and, you know, what they did, they would have been traditional tinsmiths and, and was horse dealers that were part of some of their background. And then you had other families in other parts of the country who, who were had broader circuits, you know, the horse dealers would travel much further sort of circuits and would have traveled within a province as opposed to a couple mm. of counties. Um, travellers rarely travel across the country maybe some musicians who travelled uh, or followed the fairs so I mean going to, to, to Puck or going to Banlaslow or going that was part of their economic activity as well so those families would have travelled probably more extensively than, than shall we say traditional tinsmiths or or in some cases, horse stealers obviously tra- followed the fairs as well. Mm. Um, so there was, there was there was economic reasons for travelling, and 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 if you were, but but sometimes the fairs were kind of a gathering place for all all of the community. So whether you were a horse stealer or a tinsmith or a musician, 
you met people at fairs and, and people went to fairs and certainly Van Slow and, and Puck Fair were, were renowned, renowned locations for travellers yeah. and still are I and mean, Puck would still be a big a big gathering place for traveller families. Most of the travelling people don't they deal now in animals? They used to but not now because they can't sir. Ah really? Because yeah. the animal, uh, you can't buy an animal today. Yes, I know. They're so you can't, dear. They're so dear. Ah, really? They're so dear. But I used to see them down at Puck Fair, you know, in sure, Kerry. It was the travelling man's yeah, living one it time. it was. And a big change then. But not today. And the donkey. No donkeys, of course. But they are gone. Ah, really? They are gone. Well, you used to go to Puck Fair? Yes, yes sir. I was, oh, in, it, I was yeah. in it nearly a child. We well, enjoyed it very well for three yeah. days. Oh, yes. my, oh, my yes. mother was in it all right. I though. was. But I wasn't with you then. I, uh, did they see the monument where, yes. the, where the punk all y- used to go? You were in it all right, but I, I wasn't with I had to go time. see you. There was so yeah, much talk about it. I wasn't with my mother and father. There used to be a big fight. You used to go to Ballinasloe. I was in Ballinasloe. Let's uh, races. Let's races. Yeah. Yes, indeed, and I used to see great fights there with the Bryans. Oh, and and uh, the Sheridans. Oh, yes. And the Quilligans. That's right. And the travelling people and the would, leave, would leave. Up there in August, they're great north. That's right, that's right. Races that's right, that's right. Uh, that's quite right. And the Galway races. Yes, I was at the Galway. Slow Fair. Fair, yes, I was at them also. There was a famous fair up in County Cavan at a place called Muff. Where Muff, I was, I was, I was, I was, so yes, I was. Gone Tis, well, as a matter of fact, you wouldn't, you needn't, uh, you needn't think you can be fully sure, full sure, and you needn't be on doubts of saying all fairs are nearly finished, sir. Yes, the, yeah, the cattle the marts, marts have, the right. cattle marts have done away yes. with them, and then as far as horse fairs is concerned, the um, those factories, the two Irish factories here have finished that Stra- yes. Straffan Forty Four down here uh, at this side of Nace, yes. Straffan Forty Four County Kildare. Yes. Well, they're they're the no more exporting on horses now, do you see? But they're exported now dead yes. for yes. human consumption. They're exported abroad, like for France and, France and Belgium and all those, you see. But you ask the question when you travel. I mean, I suppose for money because of the nature of traveling uh, and the nature of their accommodation um they went with the good weather effectively so from mm-hmm. march onwards uh, they would be on the roadside um perhaps during the winter they'd find actual more permanent lodgings or locations to live um that's interesting because you know the notion of traveling in the kind of very bright um uh from buying sort of wagons and stuff mm-hmm. it's, it's quite recent you know mm-hmm. that was something that came in a period from the 1910s to the 1960s it's a short lived it's, it's, yeah, it's in a very iconic yeah it's very iconic and the, and the wagon itself is something I was sitting here I was looking at some images of, uh, around the centre here trying to find pictures of wagons you know mm. the barrel top is something that was that Irish travellers adopted in the 1910s from from English Romany who came to Ireland uh, particularly in the 1914s um, and during the First World War and, and then became synonymous particularly the barrel top wagon became synonymous with Irish travellers uh, to a period up into the, the late 60s, into the mid-70s. Uh, but prior to that, the travelling and accommodation would have been roadside, um, barrel, um, bow-top tents yeah. on the roadside. Um, and, and that was something that you needed, you could only do in effectively good weather. You wouldn't, you'd want to be stuck in those tents, I suppose, yeah. in, the, in the middle of winter. Well, tell me, where used to you spend the winter mainly? Oh, in the town? Oh, well, we used to spend the winter at home in the at town. Home. Oh, yes, sir, yes. Living? We, in had a, we had a house in Enniscorty, and then we used to live in my aunt's place. My aunt had a farm up there in the county, in the county works for there, alongside the Rackers of Killam. Ah, I see, uh, yes. My aunt had a farm oh, there. Yes, yes. Yes, my aunt had a farm and there. In the summertime, you'd be in the summertime, then we'd travel. And you'd travel many counties? We'd travel nearly every county. Would you really? Yes, but I travelled an awful lot more than my father and mother. My father travelled more abroad, all right, but not of Ireland. I travelled more of Ireland. I travelled the whole 32. My mother I didn't. My mother here didn't, nor my father didn't. So winter lodgings were something a bit more permanent, so they may well have taken housing or, 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 or low-quality sort of re- um, cottages, perhaps, and rented mm. in, particularly in, 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 in towns and villages around the country, there was areas, and, and there are still some areas that are specifically renowned as Tinker's Quarters, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there are parts of the Midlands where there are roads and there are streets that were, were known as Tinker Street or Tinker Road, like, mm. you know? So, um, travelling has changed over the centuries, and, and you know, people say, now, well, travellers don't travel anymore, they're all living in houses, majority, I and mean, there are still some many families on the roadside, but for me, that doesn't signify the end of travellers because that's just a different way of, different form of accommodation. And, and, and forms of accommodation have changed in the past as well. Mm. So mm-hmm. uh, what we're seeing now may be what travellers are adapted to mm. because that's what they need to do now. But it doesn't mean that 
they've given up um, I'm going back to what Michael said at the very beginning what you read about f- from Mike McDonald's at the very mm-hmm. beginning that they've given up on the mindset of mm-hmm. nomadism I think the mindset of nomadism is still strong in many traveller families can I read on that read something else <clears throat> from Michael again from this essay mm-hmm. which kind of speaks to what you're saying there um, and it talks about accommodate nomadism and accommodation this is called and it has a, a subheading and a fear of being sedentary and it says travellers view of accommodation differs vastly from that of country people Travellers see accommodation as a stopping place regardless of whether their stay turns out to be a long or a short one. Whether living on a halting site or in a house, any kind of accommodation is seen in a temporary capacity. Temporary could mean anything up to 20 or 30 years. In the past you had summer and winter camps. Houses are seen as winter camps. When you as a traveller go into a house, it is one of the most frightening experiences you can have. It is a realisation that this is where you could stay for the rest of your life. This is it. Some travellers have become physically physically sick from being in houses and realising that the authorities are expecting them never to move out. It's hard to imagine what it is like for people to say, this is the end of the road. Which I think it's, it's an interesting, like that settled people I think would not, understand, not get. Um, but it's an interesting kind of point, even, even the one that he makes about many settled people travel way more than many mm. travellers, but, mm. but they're not travellers. Uh, yeah. so, so it's this... I, I remember a few years ago reading something that... Um, Came from Chrissy Ward, and Chrissy would have been a well-known so she poet, and 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 she also would have been well-known activist in the travel community. Uh, he actually, she's grandmother of, of John, John Connors. Uh, and I remember Chrissy, I think, was making a comment. I think the family had been accommodated at times in and been provided with housing. And I mean, Chrissy making a statement. Well, now that she had the house, she could travel, because uh, what was happening at the time in the A, he certainly, if, if travellers moved on from a campsite, they were being blocked up and, and bouldered up so they couldn't return. So effectively, there was this campsites were effectively being closed and you, could, you couldn't move. So I mean, in some cases, if travellers moved, they were, you know, immediately didn't frozen, have out. frozen out and didn't, couldn't return to that particular area. And if they wanted to come back, you know, in a few months or send kids back to school in a few months' time, they couldn't have a place to come. But having a permanent base allowed her to travel. And, and that showed the mindset, yeah, I think. You yeah, know, I think yeah. I'll never forget that comment she made. So, you know, having the permanent base meant she could travel. Um, and I think that's that's something that many travellers would have thought about. It's, it's, and I think certainly during the 70s and 80s, the temporary nature of traveller location, travel campsites, uh, meant that if you did move, the boulders came in immediately and mm. you were blocked out and you couldn't return. Um, and then obviously, you know, moving you'd know where to go. I mean, a lot of traditional campsites have been blocked off and there were no to move to, you know. The first time you pull in into a camp in Kerry, when you pull in the first night or the first day, the paper wouldn't pass much steam in you. But you go out around the next day selling a few things. And when you get talking to the people and the neighbours get talking amongst one another. That's right. That night, the second night you were there, there'd be three or four neighbours that come to your fire and they sit there around the fire at turf. No. The following night, to be as much more, and they keep on increasing. Mm. Well, there maybe six men out of twenty had come with six bags of turf. Your sweet yeah. You'd see more of them coming with a meat, yeah. with a can of meat. Yeah. More of them coming, more of them coming with a bucket of potatoes. Yeah. And you'd see them people would be lonesome when they'd live there. They would. But then you wanted, as my mother says before, you wanted to give and take and pull with those people. And you wanted to be right. right. And you wanted to be right with sure. the people. Sure. But I mean, clever people to be wrong, want to be uh, for people to ill treat you, I think, or for to be hard against you, like, I think that you leave that in those people's power yourself. I think if you're right with anybody, those people will be right with right. you. Yeah. That there's a, a, a lot, an awful lot depends on yourself, yeah. whether to be right or be wrong. Yeah, if you're right, you'll be right, I suppose. But, uh, uh, but then there's things. parts of Ireland that I was right in myself. Yeah. I mean, as a matter of fact, thanks be the Almighty God, I never done nothing wrong nowhere, matter where I went or where I didn't, because I never lived or wasn't brought up that way. I just meddled with my own share and nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if I could do a turn for a person, I'd do it. And if I couldn't, I wouldn't. What's that line? There's a there's a bylaw to say you must be on your way, and another to say you can't wander. Do you know yeah, that mm-hmm. comes from Ewan yeah. McCall wrote the Twenty Foot Trailer. Yeah, it comes from one of those songs. There's right, a, a, a poem, lovely poem here. I'll read from Chrissy Ward singing. You mentioned her there, and it says, "Mother tells stories in the dark black roads, poking the stick fire, afraid of the ghost, talking of hell, the Lord up above." me waiting to lie at my mother's toes. There's lovely images in this wee, wee poem. Yeah, Chrissy would have been... She's done some lovely poetry and, and, and some very evocative poetry, I think, over the years. Uh, I think. 
Um, one of the, the things you mentioned there about like, the sense of being kind of frozen out on like legislation and so on, and through the 70s and 80s, like, has traveller culture been essentially criminalised by legislation, by the state in ways? Um, well, I suppose an aspect of it has. I mean, certainly the idea of, of um, travelling or nomadism certainly has been um, criminalised and certainly most, most famously sort of in, in, in legislation from, from, from um, the early 2000s. But, I mean, historically, there's been phases of legislation that have gone back. You know, you go back, right back to... The, I suppose the origins of travellers are the first, and, and if you go back even into the origins of Romani, and, and there's kind of a connection, I suppose, between Romani gypsies and, 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 and Roma across Europe. And, you know, whilst Irish travellers wouldn't necessarily claim uh, a Roma origin, you know, there is a shared a shared life and a shared, a, shared, a shared place in the societies in which they live, you know, and both communities have been highly ostracized uh, over historically and you know you look across Europe I would say there has been historic phases of legislation that have done various things and you know from the extreme of, of you know certainly coming right into the mid 1940s in Germany and the extreme of, of, of murdering gypsies with, with Jews in the Holocaust you know but over the centuries there's been various laws which have effectively sought either to push out f- gypsies and travellers or to criminalise aspects of their lifestyle or way of life and, and they've gone in phases they've, you know I said initially you know across Europe you would have had legislation in the 1500s 1600s and 1700s that effectively excluded gypsies and travellers from locations and you know literally kept them out of kingdoms or kept them out of out of, out of countries um, and then you had legislation which effectively criminalised them for being what they were I mean in you know there was legislation in Britain certainly that, uh, into the 1700s that effectively made it a crime to be a gypsy and, and the last men hung for being gypsies in England were in the Old Bailey in, I think in the 1790s you know there were literally there was no other reason for their punishment except that they were members of, of, of a gypsy group or a gypsy band mm. um, and then the legislation changed and it became more about concern for vagrancy and so vagrancy you had this notion of associating uh, travelling and nomadism and and that way of life with vagrancy. So gypsies became vagrant, travellers became vagrant, and so the aspect was to was to control vagrancy. And certainly in Ireland and Britain, you had the vagrancy acts in, in, in the 1840s and, and, and later times. And you know, being a vagrant then became the criminal offence. So if you didn't have a home or you wandered abroad, uh, you were, that was the offence so wandering abroad without an excuse effectively um, <laughs> and, and that is the terminology and that was on the Irish statute books until the 1980s and it was you know before it was, it was sort of so you know you know you know, I, I was born in a, into a, a travel family in, in, in the late 1960s, um, in 1970s. You know, we wandered abroad in a caravan and in, in a wagon. Did you have uh, an excuse? I didn't have an excuse. Well, apart, <laughs> from, being, apart from being an infant, I suppose I had, I had the defense of infancy, but my parents didn't have, <laughs> have an excuse. But like over time, you know, so there, what happened, you had legislation that was brought in to deal with certain aspects of the culture. So mm. rather than get the entire identity, you had... So, Cut you know, you, you talk about fortune telling and, and your grandmother being a fortune teller. I mean, that was sort of very associated with Romany families in Britain and, 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 and travel women in Ireland, in, you know. And the idea of, of fortune telling became criminalised. And mm. it was criminalised purely because gypsy women in Britain word, word. were fortune tellers, you know, mm. and wandering fortune tellers particularly. So what you had from sort of from the late 1800s, sort of 1900s, um, seven, late 1700s probably should I say is that you had aspects of the culture being criminalised so mm. whether it was um, being a fortune teller whether it was uh, vagrancy um, um, or whether it was sort of dealing without licences or, or being involved in trades without licences they all became controlled by legislation mm. and then travellers were caught within that legislation and certainly vagrancy laws were used against travellers for, for, for very many years and then at a later time certainly at, at the turn of the 1800s into the 1900s you had a concern with children uh, education became the issue that so if children weren't being educated 
you could take the children away. Just like the spectre of the cruelty man. Exactly, and that's where it comes from. It comes from the Children's Act in 1908, and it comes from other legislation that came later. Uh, and it was a bit like the, you know, taking away the, the Aboriginal children in Australia in the 1920s and 1930s. It, it became the same excuse. You know, if children weren't being educated, society had to have a concern. So society invented or created laws to take the kids away. So in, in, 19, in the Children's Act 19... 1908, uh, you have uh, section 170, 118, which dealt with the children of vagrants. Uh, and that applied in Ireland. Actually, it's quite an interesting case, which because rarely the legislation in the past got challenged, but certainly in, in the 19, 1908 Children's Act came into effect in 1909, in April 1909. And the very first case, one of the very first cases in Ireland was taken against a woman. I don't know if she was a traveller woman, but she certainly was uh, travelling around the roads of, of, of County of West Cork around Clonakilty. And she was travelling with her child, her Mary Culhan was her name. She was travelling with her child, Ellen. And Ellen hadn't been getting in school. And, and the local uh, RIC man said, look, you're travelling around with a child. Can you show me that she's been given a school or a proper education? Mary obviously turned around and said, no, I can't because she hasn't been in school. So she was brought before the local magistrates um, um, and she was charged under Section 118 with not, not having her child in school. And the local magistrates were about to convict her when they noticed that the legislation mightn't apply in Ireland because they're obviously in West Cork and down beyond Leap and it's well known that if you're beyond Leap, you're beyond the law. <laughs> but um, they said, look, they actually raised an interesting point that the legislation provided for 200 attendances in school a year. Uh, and under the English system at the time, the English education system, I think it's still, it's still the case that there are two attendances recorded each day in, in, in England, in English schools, primary schools particularly. You're, atten- you're, you're recorded in the morning, you're recorded in the afternoon, so that counts as two attendances. Whereas the Irish Education Act at the time, and still is the case, you're only, a, you're only one attendance per day in school. So actually, because you were required to have 200 attendances under the Act, no, Nobody no, in Ireland no, could ever yeah, comply could with it, yeah. yeah. And and the magistrate knows know, knows this, and he said, oh, there's a problem here." So they actually acquitted Mary and said, "Go on, head off among the fushi, like you're, you're well able to travel around and not breaking any laws in Ireland because the law doesn't apply." Um, but the local, the, obviously the inspector who had arrested her and said, "Look, he he had a case stayed at the time and sent it up to the High Court, or what the equivalent of the High Court was in in, in Dublin at the time," and they said, "No, he, the law applies across the kingdom." So it applies down in, in, in Cork as it does apply anywhere else. Mm. Uh, so she, I don't know if Mary ever was brought back to court or if she was ever convicted of it, but certainly the, the, the law was there. Um, so I suppose the point I'm making is that, you know, different things became different, different aspects became different concerns for society. At different stages. Yeah, different society, stages. Mm. And, and I suppose there was an, a lightening of those concerns over the years, but certainly, you know, concern for children and the education of children became a big issue and I suppose with the foundation of the Irish state vagrancy was still an issue and you know you come along to the itinerance report in in, in, yeah, in, 60s, in, in 1963 yeah. 61 and a report in 63 you know the definition of itinerant in in that is the same definition of, of, of vagrant as was taken from the vagrancy legislation. So it's exact same. It's carry over from a pre- from yeah, a previous order. It's carry over. So it was dealing with itinerants as vagrants. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Ireland, you know, in, in the 1940s, the Education Act in 1940, you had, a, in the 43, had a very specific requirement in section, I think it was section 19, of registration of all vagrants, all travellers in Ireland had to register on the 1st of May every year. And they had registered the number of children they had and where those children were attending school. Nobody else in the country was required to register. So they had to, if the law had come into effect, they would have to walk into a guard station and register. And if they didn't register, they were committing a criminal offence. Now that, criminal offence. Yeah, so that legislation obviously never came into effect because it was sent to the Supreme Court on, on a different issue and it was held to be unconstitutional. But I suppose what I'm getting at is that specific provision was in there and never really caused anybody any concern. But, um, you know, if you're talking now about having to register people, but yeah, when you're looking at the period of time we're talking about, it's in the 1940s when horrible things were happening with states uh, and the treatment mm. of, of gypsies across <laughs> Europe and forced registration and forced settlement. Mm. And, you know, we were introducing that type of legislation in Ireland in the 1940s. Mm. Um, so, as I said, the concerns have changed and, and the reasons for legislating have changed. But certainly... More recent times, um, there have been progresses 
um, and there has been, I suppose, regr- you know, there's been regression as well. But mm. certainly, equality legislation has progressed things. I think in the 1990s, um, and then there has been some regression in terms of, I suppose, what's described as a criminalisation of of nomadism mm. as well through trespass legislation, mm. you know. And isn't there, to a certain extent, you can see the kind of the legislating out of existence of cultural expressions like major horse fairs and things like in Smithfield Square, where it isn't mm. that that's only now, is it once a year? But it's just this idea of, of a lack of space for informal expressions of culture in a way, and everything yeah. has to be regulated. Like, and so you see this tension all the time between, I suppose, formal expressions of culture and then and informal expressions of it. And it's, it's an excess of the one which I find a bit, uh, what would you say, stifling. So I'm always slightly sorry when I see those kind of patches in public life disappear they become regulated out of existence. Bit, yeah because yeah. it's no, part of the colour yeah, and yeah, the strangeness yeah. of life and, yeah. and the, the the types of um, occurrences and events and things that just that, that mm. can are more well, interesting I mean more isn't, isn't that true like those sort of fears that I mean, and famously were regulated out of existence or banned I mean the, the most famous the pattern days well the most pattern days but the most famous being the ballet the, is it the Donnybrook Fair was, yeah. was banned just now the name of very, a very genteel <laughs> shop yeah, 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 yeah. banned because of the violence of the participants who weren't travellers by the way yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you know so yeah, this yeah. idea and uh, yeah so it has you know I agree I think gathering places in Ireland like you know, whether it's fairs or horse fairs or, or, or patrons and mm. certainly for travellers patrons were important and, and are important to an extent mm. I mean certainly you know places like um, the Reek um, Crook Park uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of uh, yeah uh, or, or gathering in it on, 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 on Our Lady's Feast Day in, in Knock is still a very important um, patron yeah. and not a formal patron but a gathering no, on a day yeah. you know? so I think a lot of formal patrons probably don't exist anymore but mm. you know holy places like wells and, mm-hmm. and, and places of devotion you know I think many travellers still 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 practice a very populist type of religion it's, it's almost like a it's not the f- you know where the formal church going perhaps is is not as far as as, as mm. prevalent as it was in the past. There's still a strong faith in 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 places that were considered mm. holy Definitely, and yeah. considered mm. sacred. You know whether it was um, and and certainly wells and and as I said celebrating um, uh, Saint Patrick or, 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 in Croke Patrick or, or celebrating Saint uh, or Lady mm-hmm. or Saint yeah. Bridget's Day. Yeah. I mean uh, particularly I mean, for Midland families, but but. Um, those sort of that sort of expression of fate is still very popular and yeah. very common among travellers, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to move briefly because I'm just aware of times so to, about to mention because again, people might not be aware of um, Kant, Gammon, Shelter, the traveller language, mm. and this is something that Paul McGrane, who worked for the Folklore Commission, well, before the Folklore Commission was established, actually, he he had met uh, Delargy, who established the commission. He was a teacher in Longford, and he. Uh, collected a lot of material with a woman only power um, but he, he made these collections near, in the early 30s of, of Kant which is a sort of quote unquote secret language basically that was only used in certain contexts I was out cycling one day in my own part of the South Lanford and I passed this teacher's camp a very poor for the time, poor tent and a little old woman sitting in front of a few small little sticks there was something Something was prompted me, I don't know what, to jump off the bicycle and go back to her. I started talking to her. And out of curiosity, I just said, do you know any stories? Oh, she said, I could tell you stories from this this day week. <laughs> so, I became interested and asked her to name some of the stories she could tell me. So I wrote down a list, names of nine or ten stories. The job was how to get them. She was there that day. I wouldn't be there for another week. So she told me that she was going to, for the winter, she was going to live in a cottage nearby. The man of the house was going to let her use the room downstairs, as she put it. So I said, what part of Ireland do you come from? She said, from the west. I said, do you know any Irish? No, she said she didn't know any Irish. She had an odd word. She didn't know Irish. But she says, I have a language of my own. Have you? I said to her, I have, she said. Do you know what she said? I could be cursing you and talking about you to somebody else, to another traveller, and you wouldn't know what we were saying. 
So I began to laugh. I thought she was joking me. And uh, I asked her how. So she said, now you see those sticks there, she said. I do, I said. Well, she said, what do you call that? I said, that's a fire. Now she said, that's a terror. Or you could call it a terror. And that my chair here is a, she was sitting on the big stone, my chair here is a car joke. So that made me more and more interested. And I said, I go back and see her when she settled into the house the following moment, which I did, and brought her over to my own home. I had a nedophone at the time, and she spent the whole day telling me stories. This isn't the fire. Afterwards, she went to live in a yard in Ballymahon in a disused stable of herself and her son. The following year, I moved to Edifor to Ballymahon and spent several Saturdays there till I had collected all her stories. I wonder have either been looked into Kant much or Gammon much at all. No, I mean, as I know, well aware of it. I mean, it's spoken. I mean, it's. A, I mean, some people. Yeah, there is. I suppose some debate as description whether it's a secret language or what type. But it's probably in certainly in my generation and probably in my parents' generation it was never a full language as such. Mm. That was, it, but it was used, and certainly my mom and my my mom particularly uses it and has you know gives it a lot. And I think the particular, I suppose, dialect that was collected by. Morgan Green was the sort of Midland dialect. They, they, mm. they picked the, the families in the Midlands. But I don't think it's a massive distinction between how it was spoken. I think more recent writers on the language have kind of created this notion of dialects or distinction and gammon being one form or mm. camp being one form. I think, you know, I think across the country it was spoken by travellers and usually kind of used at fairs or gatherings. In, in a certain a, context. In a certain was, context. Yeah. And I, in, in many cases the context was... The community it was it was you secretly not see it wasn't used secretly as a secret language but it was used to keep secrets yeah yeah, yeah 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 so it was used in, it, yeah. in the presence of, of of the settled community or, or certain officials maybe or officialdom mm. and if you want to communicate something to, to 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 your family or to your friend or whatever you'd use can't mm. um and the methodology was replacement words so you'd use sentences that sounded normal mm. but you had replaced a number of words in it which made it kind of meaningless to person yeah. was hearing it you know but it was obviously me- meant something to the person that you were del- your target mm-hmm. and you were delivering it to, <laughs> so it was used in that way, you know. And um, it's yeah, I think there's still a, and I think more recently there's an interest in it. I mean, I certainly know there's there's, there's a number of people uh, certainly um, collecting it and and promoting it and, and now using the internet as a way of promoting it. And, and I think there's the idea of an app being being mm-hmm. developed to, to allow people to learn some of it. Yeah, myself and my cousin, just my cousin Marianne, <laughs> I'll mention yeah. her, mm-hmm. but because uh, I'll be sending on the podcast. But uh, yeah, no, Marianne just got in touch with me to, she's dying to learn. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, Marianne's a fury as well. And so I sent her, I came in here and collected, just copied some from McGrainer's collection. Mm. And so we're trying to learn a sentence every week and things like that, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, I've always been interested, but I, I, I wouldn't know where to look on the internet for it to be honest yeah but, uh, there is certainly um, okay. different locations and, uh, and I know that, that uh, it's, uh, I suppose uh, one of the, uh, an activist who was involved in the language um, on the Bardoon has, has been oh, looking yeah. at the development of an app and, and using the language as an app you know in, in that way and so that, you know modern technology has been used to revive it and I think mm. You know, it's still used. I mean, there's many young travellers would still have it, and it's probably been used in the way I described. Not, it's I, I wouldn't describe it as a secret language. Uh, I suppose I'd use it to uh, to keep it, to keep secrets, you know, mm-hmm. or to keep as a form of communication when you don't feel safe in the environment. In the you're in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's used that way, and and mm. certainly a mom would still have, you have a lot of words that she'd use at times, or, or she'd. Um, and so I understand some, but I don't speak it, but I, I don't understand a lot of the words uh, that, that when I hear them. Uh. What name have you for the language? Well, we just there? call it gammon in our, to our gammon, service. Right? Yeah. Gammon, we call it. Did you ever hear it called camp? I did, yes. I did. A shelter? A shelter, yes. You don't speak it among yourself? We know, so we never no. use that. I know. We never use it at all. Well, when do you use it? Well, 
We use that only in a very, very, very odd I time, know. like, I mean... I, have a tra- I know a number of travelling people. I used to hear <coughs> them at Puck Fair. Yes. And I used to hear them speak... You'll hear it in the fair. When they wouldn't want other people... The very to well, the only, the very the only time know. that you will hear that spoken in a fair... Yes, yes. That's when there's a couple of men there, there wanting to buy a horse. Like your bargain, yes. You see, then they'll they talk to... to other people know, know their business. That's right. You see saying. what they're yes, saying. Well, I that's know. why... And in a pub... You'll yeah. probably hear a few words of it in a oh, pub yeah. past. Yes, yes. But outside that, you won't hear it past. But I'll tell you now, if, um, for instance, if you and this gentleman here and uh, our ladyship here, yeah. our ladyship here came to us for to interview us yes. and was talking to us, well, you may hear a bit of it there then because we're wanting to know who you are, yes, what you yes, are, we want to know what this man is yes, and uh, what the attitude may yeah. be. Yeah. And you may hear it used in a little bit of it then. Yes, I know. Yes. But outside of that, you'll never hear it used. No, no, I know. If you if you were constant coming to our place, yeah. and when we know who you are and all that, yes. you'll, you'll never hear it. Never hear it. You talk yeah. English, just. Yes. We speak English now. If police come now, guards, <laughs> we'll say if the guards come, well, we're able to talk yeah, from one to the other day. Oh, they'll never from. Our horse brigand, or there must be something wrong. Do you understand yes. it? Uh, what uh, what do you call a horse? A curry. Curry. And a mule? Have you any word? No. 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 Or a donkey? A mallard. Mallard is an a mallard. ass. A mallard. Mallard is an ass. An ass, yes. And the dog? A camera. 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 Well, plack the camera. That's how the dog. We see if it is man. Plack the camera. Plack the camera. Well, we could say that our guard wouldn't know. Stage the worms. Stage plank the shade dogs. Stage the shade dogs. Plank, plank the camera. Plank the camera. Plank the That's when you have no license. That's some yes. of our lads that run high the dogs. Stage the, the shade dogs. Is that the guards? He, here's the guards. Here's the guards. Shade dogs, you call shade the dogs. Shade dogs, yeah. Yes. And then you'd say, Glenn the, hide the dog. Uh, yeah, plank the, plank, plank the camera. Plank the camera, hide the dog. That's hide the dog. It wouldn't do for him to know that, you know. No, <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's very bad news if he did. Uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit, though, is no harm be times. Yes, sir. Li- so we all do that, thank you. Well, Dad, uh, uh, there's a lot of words Dad uses, like not that he 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 speak it himself, mm. but just when we were looking up me and Marianne looking up words, and we mm. say, ah, oh, yeah, that's what Dad, you know. Mm. And now I know some, like yeah, obviously Bjorn, yeah, you know the, a, yeah. the the yeah, the, the shades and yeah, the shades yeah, yeah. and the police yeah. and whatever. Gammy, as well. gammy, gammy, of course, yeah, yeah. and everyone uses gammy, but that's you know that's mm. from Kant and, yeah. thing, and but other words we were going, oh my God, that, we've we've been saying yeah. that word all our lives, <laughs> and yeah. that's a Kant yeah. word and things like that. Yeah, there's a lot that's that has actually entered yeah. into mm. the Kant. Certainly, in 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 in, in, in and I seen was it recently someone listed as. Can't like gammon words of Ireland or, or is there not gammon words, um, uh, slang words? And a lot of them, you know, and mm. they have been described as a slang, I think is, is wrong, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's, it has yeah. been adopted, and when certainly, you know, uh, uh, I remember listening to the saw doctors, certainly from Toom, you know, and mm-hmm. they would use a lot of them because of the kind of particular, I suppose, demographics of, of, of Toom. Yeah, you can't go right. with a lot of travel families who have settled in that area. And the language has become part of the <laughs> local, I suppose, dialect, you know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, there are lots of words that are getting used all the time that people don't mm. realise. And mm-hmm. they say, oh, it's, oh, it's our local word, their own word. Mm. Like it's Cork or Bure or whatever. Yeah. Like yeah. Bure's traveller language has been mm. used for years. There's you know? one, I think I heard Sean Masudo mention, um, Lack using Waterford for a girl. For, as in, oh, yeah, Lack. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, but that, the, 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 the version of Lack had been used by everyone there. Yeah, but again, it wouldn't have been known necessarily yeah. that this yeah. is the, these are the origins of it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lacking is yeah, it's girl or lack is the lush uh, drink. Lush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, boy, you know these 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 words are entering the fiend. language. The fiend, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. and and, and um, you know they're entering the sort of local dialects or local 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 languages or of mm. towns and, and cities around. I think around this the thing there's like again we were talking about appropriation at the at the or earlier on in, the, in the, our chat. Mm. And there is this kind of there's a there's an unconscious bleed back and forth between stories, tales, songs. Yes. There's an undercurrent mm. all the time. These things have lives of their own, they transcend their own immediate context in a way. But I think for a lot of people there's there's not necessarily an explicit recognition or understanding that this is from a traveller culture or traveller background. Mm. They don't have that. Mm. Um uh, that kind of sensitivity. They don't, they, they don't see that that's that that's. Mm. They're just not not aware. It's not on the on the landscape in a way. Yeah, and I think that goes back to that discussion we've had. I mean, it's some of the things that have influenced and and, and this. I mean, as an Irish person, when you know, you know, it influences 
Ireland our society and, and, mm. and settled community shall we say I, I was want of a better terminology mm. in Ireland but there is that as I said things that are, are as I said borrowed back and forth and moving back and forth you know um, and, and to me that's a positive thing because I, mm. I was earlier on I, I mean I, I'd, I'd rather sharing as opposed to appropriation I think yeah. the problem with appropriation you take something and you don't acknowledge its its origin you don't acknowledge where it's come from and you kind of you know you kind of reinvent it as your own Whereas with with sharing, it's it's part of what we are. It's it's you know it's obvious that if you're growing up in a small island, and you have two communities in that island, and they're sharing their 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 identities in some way, then that can only be positive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder maybe just to, as we finish up, is there any any is there any any sense that, anything that you wish settled people were more sensitive about, aware of that they're not like. David said, just being aware of the room, reading the room, mm. not having to read the room myself. They read mm. them. <laughs> you read the room. You read them. <laughs> that would be personally to me anyway. But mm. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of I'll share that. I mean, the, the idea just like that's that you know travelers can exist within other contexts yeah um and you know that that concept puts pressure on you because you know said you, you're the one who has to read a room but the responsibility should be on, on the people who are using the terminology and are mm. being derogatory and, and not being conscious and not being sensitive to who, who's there and, and and why you're you know and, and your entitlement to be there as well you know i mean that's that's the other aspect i mean because we you know this notion that um deliberately giving out I you know for me I, and having been as I said at my introduction to you earlier on saying that I've been involved in activism um, mm. but certainly in, 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 in the 90s and in 2000 I have been I, I have seen massive progress and I have seen things that are positive you know I've seen a lot of negatives as well but I've seen a lot of positives and I think some of the areas of education there's been positives in education there's been positives in, in, in travel representation and, and you know having travellers who are politically involved in society is, is a good thing um, so these are positives and, and you know I, people sometimes I hear a lot of negative commentary about travellers but also from travellers if you know what I mean mm-hmm. uh, and I, I just but one of them is just that there's this notion that travellers are so are so put down that mm-hmm. we're not making any progress but I actually disagree with that. I, mm-hmm. I actually think there has been progress, and there is progress, and I think I see the progress. You look at your family. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, they're, they're just individu- individuals. But mm-hmm. I mean, I think that opportunity and other individuals, and you know, I think even among the traveller community, there's I hate to use the term uh, in intelligentsia, but there is an educated grouping who are coming, you know, who are, who are developing and are, are bringing a different type of analysis mm-hmm. to identity and to who who we are as people within our society, you know. And I think that's only positive. That's 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 only going to mean, I think, good things for the future. Um, but it's also probably going to mean difficult debates and difficult discussions as well. And I, I think travellers need to be prepared to be involved in those difficult discussions. Um, but. I think there's a constant negativity sometimes as well that I just and I'm not a negative person I've never been a negative person so I, I, negativity turns me off if you know mm-hmm. what I mean I just I just can't cope with it sometimes mm. but I, I actually I, I am positive about what's happening and even though a lot of what I grew up with and what I and I don't hold on to with any sort of rose tinted window or rose tinted glasses I, you know I, I acknowledge I grew up in that context that context has changed there's a new context and, and things are always changing society always changes and you know there's some things that are part of my identity as a traveller that are tangible that I will hold on to and then there are things that are intangible um, that I can't hold on to and, but are, are still there somehow and and but the experience of my children and, and I suppose other children in, in the future is going to be different from my experience but I still have a positivity about the the contribution travellers can make to our society and mm. will make to our society you know and I think that's so I always try to maintain my positivity Good. Mm-hmm. I, hope we, I hope today has been positive as a conversation overall yeah absolutely. Um, thank you both so much really really appreciate it really enjoyed it and um yeah, it's really insightful and glad to, to be here to be able to chat to you both and listen to you both. Um, I'm going to finish to, with just a piece of music from the Bunch of Keys from Johnny Doran. Just, you'll hear it now at the, at the end of this episode. And um, this is Shlieb Naman. Typically, Johnny Doran's kind of piping style is really frenetic and kind of fast-paced. This is a slow air. It's a big monster tune, but I want to play it in honour of the late Sean Garvey, who passed away mm. uh, very suddenly recently there. And it's kind of his sudden departure, I suppose, has devastated us all, but... 
he was a total gentleman um, he was a very kind and generous chap and I think we all loved him dearly so um, this song is for him and thanks to you both thank you thank you <laughs>